this lesson will go through the areas of knowledge, which is how the IB breaks up and categorises all human knowledge. In lesson two, we will go through two areas of knowledge, the human sciences and history. In your talk presentation and talk essay, you'll be asked to narrow down your topic and focus on one or two areas of knowledge, depending on your presentation question or your essay title. To start, let's look at the knowledge framework provided in the IB Talk Guide. It'll help us brainstorm important issues related to each area of knowledge. This is what the knowledge framework looks like. As you can see, there are five ways to approach each area of knowledge. First, we can look at scope and applications. This aspect covers the range of knowledge in the area and how the knowledge is used. Next, we can unpack relevant concepts and language. This element explores the key ideas in each area and how we produce and describe knowledge using technical, area-specific language. Then we have methodology, which refers to the distinct methods that each area uses to produce knowledge. We'll also investigate the historical development of each area of knowledge, focusing on changes over time. Finally, don't forget the links to personal knowledge. Individuals can personally contribute to shared knowledge within an area of knowledge, just as shared knowledge can impact individuals personally. Now let's check out the key ideas in each area of knowledge using this helpful knowledge framework. Along the way, we'll explore links between specific areas of knowledge. We'll also analyse the similarities and differences between specific areas. Let's dive into the human sciences. The scope and applications of the human sciences relate to human behaviour and society. Academics in the human sciences study the social, cultural, behavioural and psychological aspects of humanity. The human sciences encompass a variety of subjects ranging from economics and psychology to sociology and anthropology, which both delve into how human societies function. A lot of research in these areas aims to predict human behaviour. For example, economists might try to predict what happens when a certain product becomes trendy. Will we buy the next iPhone model if our friends buy it? This is known as herd behaviour. But is human behaviour ever predictable? In the natural sciences, a physicist might be able to predict the motion of a particle by applying physical laws and principles. But in the human sciences, things are more complex. Humans tend to break rules rather than obey them. So can social scientists ever come up with laws to predict aspects of human behaviour? The human sciences have plenty of applications. They can help us understand why a certain historical event occurred. In other words, they can help us uncover the human decision-making processes that caused an event. For instance, Emil Lederer, a German-born economist and sociologist, outlined a network of factors that led to the First World War. He highlighted that the adoption of universal conscription, the compulsory enlistment of men for military service, provided national armies in Europe with a mass of manpower that could be directed towards war. Some human sciences, such as anthropology, can help us understand how religious knowledge systems came to be, how they changed over time, and how they affect human experiences. Remember, anthropologists study human culture and society and its development. In some cases, anthropologists have compared Buddhist beliefs and practices in different countries, such as Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. Each individual subject area in the human sciences comes with its own key concepts and language. Key ideas in law will be different to key ideas in economics, anthropology or psychology. 
the human sciences often borrow language from mathematics and the natural sciences to ensure that the knowledge produced is valid and reliable. But people are complicated. Can we really use mathematical language to describe human societies, cultures and behaviour? Can knowledge generated in the human sciences ever be as objective and reliable as knowledge produced in mathematics or the natural sciences? It's very difficult, perhaps even impossible, to achieve complete neutrality, that is, zero bias, in the language of the human sciences. This means that using a reliable methodology is incredibly important for producing accurate knowledge in the human sciences. In fact, many disciplines in the human sciences rely on the scientific method. Social scientists will often make observations about human behaviour and societies, create hypotheses, test these hypotheses through experimentation, then, from there, generalise their findings into reliable and more broadly applicable conclusions. These findings generally need to be consistent with other accepted knowledge in the area. But there's a catch. It can be pretty challenging to study human behaviour using the scientific method. First of all, researchers in the human sciences must follow ethical guidelines. This limits their ability to conduct experiments on human beings. Secondly, problems can arise when you observe human behaviour. Some individuals behave differently when they're being watched. This is called the observer effect. Also, some influences on human behaviour can't be observed, such as people's thoughts. So, what do social scientists do? Many researchers will turn to other methods of extracting evidence to test their hypotheses. They might conduct interviews, develop questionnaires, or analyse historical evidence. Social scientists must carefully consider how they word questions in interviews and questionnaires. Questions need to be worded in a neutral way, rather than leading someone towards a certain answer. If someone asked you, in general, how hard do you study for exams? You might give a different answer than if they asked you, on average, how many hours do you study every day? Both questions are looking for the same information, but the first question leads you towards saying that you study hard, even if you don't. Academics in the human sciences will also use statistical methods and models to analyse human behaviour, like this graph, which helps us understand economic trends. These methods weren't always popular in the human sciences. In the past, many studies relied on assumptions when explaining human behaviour. For instance, psychologists often assumed that people behaved according to laws and rules. Meanwhile, many economists assumed that people behave rationally when making decisions. Of course, we now know that isn't the case. The historical development of the human sciences shows us how ideas about human behaviour, societies and cultures have changed radically through time and across different cultures. Early economists saw humans as utility maximisers. They assumed that consumers would aim to get the greatest value in return for the lowest cost, like when you're bargain hunting for a new phone. These days, economists have realised that humans are actually irrational and tend to make choices that are quick and practical, but not always perfect. Changes have also occurred in the field of anthropology. Western anthropology used to be interested in human progress. But eventually, anthropologists like Franz Boas pointed out that each culture defines human progress in a distinct way. The perception that some cultures or societies had progressed more than others was flawed. Over time, anthropologists realised that they shouldn't impose Western understandings of progress on other cultures. 
Turning to links to personal knowledge, many individuals have contributed important personal knowledge to the human sciences. Maybe you know about individuals like John Watson in psychology, Max Weber in sociology, or John Maynard Keynes in economics. These days, individual researchers in economics and psychology usually contribute knowledge in collaboration with others, while anthropologists are more open to individual contributions. On the flip side, shared knowledge in the human sciences impacts individuals' personal knowledge. Consider the field of sociology. By studying sociology, individuals can understand how society influences their views of what is acceptable behaviour for a man versus acceptable behaviour for a woman. This helps people to construct clearer ideas of their identity and gender norms. And think back to our example from economics, which emphasised that humans tend to act irrationally. This knowledge allows individuals to better understand their decision-making processes and potentially improve them. Let's delve into the scope and applications of another area of knowledge, history. What is the scope of history? It involves investigating and explaining the recorded past. To study the past, historians need evidence in the form of primary and secondary sources. Primary sources include first-hand accounts of an event in documents or recordings and objects produced at the time. Meanwhile, secondary sources are second-hand accounts, like what you'd find in a history textbook. We'll discuss evidence more in the methodology section. Historians tend to focus on significant events that have happened in the past. To identify significant events, they might consider how many people were impacted or the degree to which they were affected. For example, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima in 1945 would be considered a significant event, but what you did last Saturday probably wouldn't be. Studying the past helps us understand the present. It may even help us envision the future. Moving on to applications, history is extremely useful when studying the human sciences. Historical evidence can tell us about how humans behaved in different cultures, societies and circumstances. In fact, history is important across all the areas of knowledge. It helps us understand how each field has developed over time. Let's dive into historical concepts and language. Historians often focus on forming a narrative which details how events are connected and why they happened. To achieve this narrative style, historians will use both logical language and emotional language. They'll use more objective, logical language to demonstrate connections between historical events. Along the way, they'll also use emotional language so readers can connect with historical situations and understand them better. Of course, different historians employ distinct writing styles. Is there a link between a historian's language choices and the historical knowledge produced? OK, so how do historians develop these narratives? Let's move on to methodology. Keep in mind that historians aim to develop theories that explain how and why historical events occurred. In most cases, the first step is looking through the available evidence. Like we said earlier, this includes primary and secondary sources. Remember, primary sources are first-hand accounts. They're created either at the time of the historical event or later by someone who experienced the event. Secondary sources are second-hand accounts. They're typically created by individuals who have studied primary sources, like historians. The problem is, historians will often have too little evidence or too much evidence. 
When there's too little evidence, it can be difficult to put together an accurate image of the past. But if there's too much evidence, it's simply impossible to analyse everything. Imagine you're studying World War II. It would be impossible to fit information from all the relevant photos, documents, recordings and newspaper articles into one overarching text. That's where the second step comes in, selecting evidence. In many cases, historians need to choose primary and secondary sources to focus on. Ideally, they will select and analyse a diverse range of evidence to support their theories. But does that always happen? What happens when a historian only considers certain evidence, perhaps to strengthen a questionable argument? This is known as selection bias, and it can reduce the reliability of the knowledge that is produced. What's the next step? Historians need to evaluate their evidence. Are their sources accurate? Are they reliable? Indeed, how should historians assess the reliability of their sources? Beware, some primary and secondary sources might be unreliable. Even first-hand accounts of an event can be distorted as personal interests and expectations can influence individual sense perception and memory. To identify the real deal, historians need to ask some questions. For primary sources, is this source authentic and how can I determine that? What personal and societal biases might have influenced the creation of this source? And what is the historical context of this source? In other words, what was happening at the time this source was created? Along the way, historians use their reason and imagination to interpret the evidence. By carrying out this process, a historian can eventually develop a plausible theory that explains their evidence. This theory should agree with other accepted theories. Let's move on to the historical development of the field. There have been drastic changes in two major areas, historians' approaches to analysing sources and popular interpretations of historical events. While scientists since the time of Roger Bacon have mostly followed the scientific method and mathematicians have always prioritised sound deductive reasoning, Historians' approaches to knowledge production are constantly changing. In fact, there's a whole branch of scholarship that deals with how historians write history based on the critical analysis of sources. It's known as historiography. Approaches to historiography have varied considerably over the ages. For example, in the late 19th century, the historian Leopold von Ranke decided that history should be approached scientifically. He thought that we could apply the scientific method to arrive at an objective understanding of historical events. In contrast, in the late 20th century, postmodern historians like Michel Foucault argued that we can never fully understand the past. He emphasised that sources are always biased and only provide an incomplete picture of what happened. As you can see, examining different approaches to writing history raises many interesting questions about how we generate historical knowledge. It's also important to remember that our interpretations of historical events change over time. We often perceive events differently when we see them in hindsight. For example, in the 1930s, British historians like Sir James Edmonds often referred to the Great War when describing the war that occurred from 1914 to 1918. Many people believed that it was the war to end all wars. However, after the Second World War, many historians realised that earlier descriptions of the First World War needed to be revisited. Now let's look at history's links to personal knowledge. Both primary and secondary sources contain personal knowledge. Each witness or historian draws on their own beliefs, language and emotions to write and record history. 
Since history involves shaping a narrative, historians must also rely on their personal perspective, reason, imagination and intuition to construct plausible theories. Historical theories are often written by individuals. That means we rely on the interaction of individual historians to build an idea of the past. This process of converting personal knowledge into shared knowledge contrasts with other areas of knowledge, like the natural sciences. In the natural sciences, individuals often collaborate in research groups to produce accurate and reliable knowledge. So, how does this reliance on personal knowledge and individual perspectives impact the reliability of historical knowledge? Can historical knowledge ever be free from individual, cultural or national perspectives? Or was Foucault right to claim that history can never be free from human bias? Thinking critically about these questions is great preparation for your talk assessments. Top effort. We've just gone through two areas of knowledge. You're well on your way to understanding talk basics. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on talk basics, check out our next video on areas of knowledge, lesson three.